The Word became flesh and pitched a tent among us. He tabernacled with us, and we beheld His glory. Yet He was here for what seemed like just a vapor of time, and that is because He was never meant to stay. I am in this world, but not of this world. He would say, Yeshua's life bears the, king, the striking symbolism of God's people after their exodus from Egypt, as they ventured into freedom and tabernacled in the wilderness. <clears throat> Pitch a tent, but be sure it's built as a temporary structure because you won't be staying very long. This is not your land. You're just sojourn sojourners passing through, and your permanent home is elsewhere. It was true for the Israelites in the wilderness. It was true for Yeshua when he was born into this world. And it is true even for you. This is not your permanent home and the body in which you live. It's not your permanent body. In this world you will have trials. He has overcome this world. In your permanent body and in your permanent home, there will be no more trials, no more tears, no more pain. There will be only righteousness, peace, and joy. The imagery in the Feast of Tabernacles is striking. But that should come as no surprise because that is what all the feasts of the Lord offer. Stories are real and knowing about the historical events and their prophetic significance is both important and profitable. God makes promises and we should never settle for less than what He has guaranteed. Had Israel settled in the wilderness, built permanent housing and walled cities, they would have never inherited the fullness of God's covenant. It would have fallen short of God's destination. Do you do that? The implications for such are staggering, both personally and prophetically. Or does it look like personally? This world is all there, is, and the things of this world are what I am after to satisfy my soul. Yet it is after those very things the Gentiles seek. Don't. For all that is in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life, are not of the Father. And the world is passing away, and the loss of it, but he who does the will of God will tabernacle forever. That is precisely the prophetic implication to tabernacle forever. This is not your land. You're just sojourners passing through. Your permanent home is elsewhere. Your ultimate citizenship is in heaven. Here on earth, you have no permanent city, so you must seek the one to come. You're heading for a permanent place to dwell in permanent glorified dwellings. Knowing this is to your great advantage. Now for the reading of God's holy word. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year shall be a statue forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in Booth for seven days. All who are native Israelites shall dwell in Booth, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in Booth when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. It's Leviticus chapter 23, verses 41 to 43. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. The glorious of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 1, verse 14. For now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. John chapter 17, verses 13 to 14. Join me in a word of prayer. Father, it is so awesome to be reminded in worship that there is no name above your name, that no power or positions or dominions are greater than you. And we're reminded in your word of those very facts, that you are the sovereign one, that you are the one that has granted us life in the here and the now, that you are the one above all creation, and that you give to us the capacity to be engaged in your holy economy. What an awesome gift that is, that we can be people doing kingdom business here on earth that has an eternal perspective, something way, way far from that which we can comprehend. But you see a fit that each and every one of us that walks worthy of your calling can be an ambassador for your kingdom. And here in Kingdom Embassy Ministries, we desire to seek the depth of your words like no others. And we ask that your 
Spirit will be the one that will speak directly from your Holy Writ to each and every one of our hearts, that we may fulfill that which you've desired and designed for each and every one of us to do. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Welcome. My name is Manny. I get the opportunity once again to introduce both this ministry and Dr. Jeff. As I said in my prayer, this is Kingdom Embassy Ministries, and our website goes by that same name. Just add the .org at the end. And as I always ask you and tell you, if you have not gone to that website and navigated it or spent any time looking at the videos or reading the, the, the notes that we have there, please do so. Our uh, brother Larry Hawks, who's away for a season of time, does a fantastic job at upkeeping that website. It is a, an amazing, amazing site. As I always tell you a little something before the, uh, before the teaching, just yesterday as I was spending time at the gym, I was about to do uh, some legs, which I despise doing, and uh, there's this little cushion that I normally put behind my back just to, for protective purposes. And there's usually about 15 or 20 of them laying around all over the place. Usually I don't have to look for anything. They're just there. But for whatever reason, yesterday morning I was looking for one. Just, I just needed one. And I found myself looking in every single machine and up and down the, the rows, and I, I couldn't find a single one. And I said to myself, I must be missing something here. Like, there's, these things are always everywhere. Unless somebody just decided to walk away with all of them, like, there's no possible way they could all be gone. <coughs> so I said, let me look for something else. Let me go look for something to wipe the machine down that I'm about to use. Well, sure enough, no more than like five seconds after that, as I started walking towards the little paper towel rack and the little spray thing so you can wipe the machine down, there they was. It was like three of them stacked on top of each other. Now you can say to yourself, well, what does it have to do anything with spiritual life? Immediately I was reminded of Matthew 6.33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And I was reminded of that because a lot of times in our life, we spend time looking for things that have nothing to do with his kingdom. We're looking for things for ourselves first as opposed to looking for his kingdom first. And we find ourselves looking and trying to find those ahead of that, and you don't get that provision. You may be someone who is single, and you're, you're spending all of your time trying to figure out who's going to be that spouse that you're going to find, and you're spending all of your time thinking about that someone. Maybe you're like, when am I going to find this person? My, my, my clock is ticking. I got friends of mine on that, on that bus. They're just asking this question, and I see them all the time going to the, all these places looking for that certain someone. It's like when you look for your keys. You ever realize that when you lose your keys, sometimes they're right next to you, and you just, just miss them? That's kind of what was happening to me that, that very moment, and I just, I just felt that tug in my heart where at times, even in my very own life, what am I using my capacities for? What am I using my time with? What am I doing with certain things? Am I utilizing them to the best of that which I could use them so that I could seek his kingdom first? See, that in that section of scripture in Matthew chapter 6 is the area where Jesus is telling his disciples about not worrying about food and clothing and certain things. And a lot of times, we'll, fall ourselves, we'll put ourselves in the condition that we get worried about not getting the things that we think we either want or we believe deeply that we need and we end up in that worry we end up pushing God's desire for our life out to the side and saying you know God I, I don't think you're getting this to me quick enough I need to go ahead and get it myself I need to go ahead and do this myself have you ever found yourself in that condition where you think that God is actually too late giving you something that you desperately want or you desperately think you need and you're somehow, some way thinking that if you maybe make a few adjustments or maneuvers, that you'll get that to happen and say later on, man, I should have not pushed for that because that's not really what God wanted for me. I know it might seem like a weak comparison, but to me it made a lot of sense when I found myself in that little conundrum. Um, 
I think for, for our very own lives, if you sit back and you actually look at what you're spending your time searching for, you might actually come across it the same way that I came across those three little things laying all by themselves, all the same. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you're not going to be surprised. Good evening. How are you? It's good to be here. Matthew 6, 33. That Bible verse is in this sermon. He didn't know that, of course. He never reads the notes in advance. Um, and even that whole concept about the things we're seeking, maybe you didn't even know that that, that literally has the, the, the energy and the, the spiritual, prophetic picture of the Feast of Tabernacles. Right? This entire concept of tabernacles is the temporary dwelling. It's the thing that's temporary, that you shouldn't be putting your roots down in it. You shouldn't be looking for it to satisfy you permanently. Isn't that exactly what Matthew 6.33 is saying? Why are you looking around in the world? We're going to get there. But I have to begin with uh, Manny and I have a very comical relationship. Very comical. We've been friends for many years. And uh, Manny went to seminary. I didn't. I went to chiropractic college. And, um, you know, we don't see everything eye to eye theologically, and we don't need to, right? We're sorting it out. We could stay friends. We can agree to disagree on things. And he, uh, he tells me right before the sermon today, he goes, you, you should have warned me that last week, you know, you got to warn me in advance when you're going to say things that you know I might not agree with. I'm like, what did I say? He's like, well, the whole sermon. No, he didn't say the whole sermon. <laughs> he didn't say the whole sermon. But I did preface when I, if you were with us last week, I said, hey, there's some things here, a number of things. I don't really know if they're really theologically solid, the things I'm exploring, things I'm thinking about, things we're digging into, things we need answers to. And so I'm not going to die on that hill. And so I didn't warn him in advance, but I thought I, I thought I warned you in advance. But let me, when you go back and watch last week's message, there's some parts. And you know what? We're going to... You know what we get to do again? Next year, when we get to Tabernacles, I mean, uh, Yom Kippur, we'll have another year to have discovered. And uh, you're welcome to come and present, hey, that was wrong, or that was right, or I got something to add. That's the whole point. I don't know anything that much more than you. I'm just, I always say I'm just one little step ahead. I just spent a lot more time. And it's a, it's a wonderful week for me. This is the first time through the fee cycle in 20 plus years for me and my family that I've taken the time to divide up the fall feasts into four separate teachings. I've never done that before. I usually just teach, I teach Yom Kippur, I've taught Yom Kippur separately, but I've never taught the fall feasts all individually, like just let's look at trumpets, let's look at Yom Kippur, and then tabernacles. And next week, such a special day um, that we're going to take the whole week out just to talk about the last great day, the eighth day of tabernacles, which is not really a feast unto itself. It's it's an added day to the Feast of Tabernacles. It has prophetic meaning. We're going to take an entire sermon to explore that. And that's going to be fun. And it's wonderful for us because it actually falls on a Friday night. First day this year, first day of Tabernacles. Here we are on a Friday night. It's like a double Sabbath. We get a, the Sabbath of the Feast and the weekly Sabbath two weeks in a row. So it's going to be a really a, anointed time. The title of today's message is called Not of This World. Tabernacles. We're going to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles and the details and the imagery. We're going to talk about, of course, hopefully for us, Yeshua and Tabernacles and his time in Jerusalem. You may not know it, but there's actually a specific event where Yeshua shows up at the Feast of Tabernacles and, and some pretty cool things happen when he does in the Gospels, uh, well, in John's Gospel. And then we're going to talk about something I think is prophetically significant of tabernacles. There's some imagery in it, in the story, and I think certainly for the future it's, it speaks to everything about what I think tabernacles is really about. Hopefully Manny's not going to say, I don't agree with that. We'll figure it out next week. But the transfiguration, or what I'm going to call today the transfigurations, two transfigurations, his and yours. We're going to talk about that. We'll start off with some background details about the Feast of Tabernacles itself. You know, I'm not going to go through the cycle again about what the fall feasts are in order or the whole thing. I'm going to do that. I think I'll do that again next week to kind of round off the feast um, season. But we know the command shows up in Leviticus chapter 22, I mean 23, verses 33 to 44. And it, it says that the first, 
So you, we do know the first day of the seventh month in the Hebrew calendar is trumpets. The tenth day is Yom Kippur. And the fifteenth day, which is today, begins the Feast of Tabernacles. And it lasts seven days. It specifically says it lasts for seven days. The first day is a Sabbath rest, regardless of the day it falls, right? That's important that the, the holy days related to the Feast of Yahweh are Sabbaths. You treat them like a Sabbath. You take off, you don't work, you, you rest, you give the day to the Lord. It happens to be on the weekly Sabbath this year, like I just mentioned. And then it says when it ends, you add another day after the seventh days, and the eighth day is also a Sabbath rest. And the big takeaway, the prophetic takeaway, is that the scripture says to dwell in a temporary tabernacle or a booth or a sukkah as a reminder of when Israel left uh, Egypt in the Exodus and how they moved around in these temporary dwellings with the prophetic significance that the land you arrive in when you leave Egypt is temporary. It's not your permanent residence. So I want you to think of that. If that's our theme tonight, I want you to think about your life and, you know, Manny's introduction. Silly little story about, you know, back support in the gym. <laughs> but the takeaway, why are we so concerned about the things of this world? Like, why do these things, you know, when sometimes it's right in front of you. And then, of course, he goes right to the uh, middle chapter in the Sermon on the Mount talking about Yeshua's great dissertation on the difference between seeking the kingdom and seeking the things of the world. See, you know, keep in mind as we go through, you seek the things of the world because you think that's where your satisfaction is going to come. You think that's where reality is. If we did, if we did something right last week, it was showing you the imagery being um, that this is fake. This is the shadow. And the heavenly is the real. So why are we seeking to satisfy all our needs in the shadow? and spending all our energy there. You'll find greater detail about tabernacles in Numbers 29. It talks about the 15th day of the seventh month. It's a holy convocation. That means like a holy gathering, an appointment, uh, a rehearsal. So we're here today. We happen to be here again because we would be here every Friday night anyway. But if we weren't, we should gather, we should gather on that day. It says, do no customary work meaning don't live your ordinary life on that day. Keep the feast for seven days again, it says. And from, from verses tw uh, 13 to 34, it talks about all the offerings. Not going to go through those details. If you want to talk about those details, go back to when we studied numbers, and you could see the details. We did that three years in a row. You could see those details. It mentions again the eighth day to have a sacred assembly. Don't do any customary work. It says that in verses 35 to 38. Again, this is Numbers 29. And we're not going to talk anything more really much about the eighth day today because we're going to spend an entire week next week talking about it, all right? One other thing I think is interesting for you to realize is uh, most, I think most scholars agree that uh, Zechariah 14, 16 and 19 is talking about uh, post-second coming, millennial kingdom stuff. And uh, so when you go there, you're seeing something going on relative to the Feast of Tabernacles in the Millennial Kingdom. That's, that could spark an entire conversation. Why are they celebrating the Feast of the Millennial Kingdom? What's the importance of it? Who's celebrating it? Does it have anything to do with you? Um, I think we could determine that, um, that you have a different state of being than, than, than people on Earth at that point in time. But here's just the point. This is what it says in Zechariah 14, 16, and 19. Go up year to year to worship the king, like there's an ongoing thing happening, going to Jerusalem to worship the king. Keep the Feast of Tabernacles, and it shall be that whichever families on the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, to them there'll be no rain. No rain. Goes on to say, the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up for the feast. There shall be a punishment of, the, of Egypt the world, the punishment of all the nations that do not come up and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's not a hill we want to die on tonight, but it's, it's an important thing that Zechariah specific, specifically mentions the feast multiple times in chapter 14, and we know this is post 
this isn't the end of the age in, in what many believe is the millennial kingdom. So why on earth is the Feast of Tabernacles important then? So I want to jump in to Yeshua and the Feast of Tabernacles. What does this have to do? Because um, Laura, who's in the back there, she uh, works at a Christian school, and she says, oh, they were asking about this holiday that came up last, uh, last week or earlier, earlier this week and said, um, it was for Sunday to Monday, what's this Jewish holiday? And she explained the whole thing about Yom Kippur and, and what, what it might mean. You know, I've had many conversations with, with uh, people this week, and even as Christians, like we're not looking for our atonement by fasting on Yom Kippur, right? You're not doing that, right? You have permanent atonement. We know that. We're not trying to add a procedure to your born-again encounter. But there's so much to do when you actually will take the time out and reflect and look and, and, and repent for your own life, the things you're doing, like the things you did this year. Well, the Feast of Tabernacles, we see, and Manny read it in the introduction when he read from John 1.14, uh, and it says, you know, he came, he, he, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. It's very important. You know, I've always saw that. I've always, always seen that chapter as this thing. Now, you know his coming to earth was temporary, right? He came in flesh temporarily. You come temporarily. So you got to see that connection. Right now, you're sitting here. You're saying, oh, this is real. This is not real. This is your temporary home. You are a sojourner in a temporary dwelling like... The Israelites were sojourners in the wilderness in a temporary dwelling. When Yeshua came and the Word became flesh, He became flesh in a temporary dwelling. It wasn't His permanent home. But the part I never really connected, like I never really hyperemphasized, was this, and we beheld His glory. I want you to keep that in mind. We beheld His glory. So what about your life today? James says this in James 4.14. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. Does that sound temporary to you? Yes. And our temporary stay, Peter warns us to not let our souls become infected with darkness or wickedness. He says this. Here's what he calls us. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. Pilgrims of what? Of this. This body this life that you think is real, you're just a pilgrim. You're a sojourner. You're passing through. Abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. He says in 1 Peter 2.11. And, and in this very prophetic book of Hebrews, it literally says this. This is not your permanent city. This is not your permanent home. For here we have no continuing city. Like, look around everything that's established, everything that you're striving for, building, whatever it is, businesses, wealth, legacy, stuff, everything that you spend most of your week thinking is the most important, God is telling you it's not permanent. It won't continue. Then it says this, but we seek the one to come. This is Hebrews 13, 14. See, now, you may say, well, you know, I built the sukkah, it's right over there, it's cool little symbolism. That's cool, but this is the real message of tabernacles. Why is it relevant for you as a Christian, sitting there, born again, and eternity secure? It's because you better get into your spirit that you are living in a temporary dwelling, a tabernacle, like Yeshua came and tabernacled for a brief period of time. Now, he knew, like you know, there was going to be a big draw to wanting what this world could offer you. There was going to be a big um, um, desire to partner and, 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 be, and make this real to give this the most value. The temptation would be, this is where it's at. Now, you may 
you're sitting there, you could say to yourself, hold on, I'm doing that. I'm doing that right now. I'm doing that right now. Like if you just even wondered whether your greatest concern today had heavenly inspirations or was it to find some cushions for your back in the gym? Like what was your greatest do that so so we did not rehearse that so so this but you could ask yourself like what did you focus on like what what is burdening you it's something to do with this temporary dwelling you're in your temporary life very likely very likely this is what this is what Yeshua said in the upper room discourse when he was giving his longest and final speech pu public it was private, but his, his earthly ministry, when he's sitting at what we call the Last Supper table, he says this, I've given them, these disciples, your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I am not of this world. Wow. I don't pray for them. I don't pray that you take them out of the world. I'm not asking you to remove their bodies from this, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Keep them from everything evil and the temptations that this body is going to face. Maybe it's persecution, maybe it's punishment, maybe it's desires, lusts, maybe it's dissatisfaction and needs not being met. He goes on to say, they are not of this world. Again, he repeats it, just as I'm not of this world, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. Right? John 17, 13 and 19. Do you see what he's saying? You're, you're not, you're sitting here, do it. You're like, yeah, this is, this is real. This just seems so real. He says, you're not of this world. This is not your permanent home. John, John, when he writes 1 John 2, 15 to 17, you know, John was sitting at that table. John penned the Gospel of John. John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John wrote the book of Revelation. When he was writing in 1 John 2, he said, he said this, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides, tabernacles forever, dwells with the Lord forever. See, that's your permanent home. This stuff, temporary. You see, if you get so enamored with this stuff, it'll, it'll clutch, it'll be like a, like a tar that gets on your body. You can't get it off. It's sticky in it, and then you want it, and you search for it, and you obsess for it, and you go after it all the time. See, the, the message of, of tabernacles is do not become enamored with your temporary dwelling. In the introduction I wrote that Manny was reading, if Israel had decided, I don't want to keep pressing through to the promise, let's set up a home here, build permanent houses and walled cities, they'd still be in the wilderness, falling short of the promise. See, so if you focus, the, the, the admonition is don't focus on possessing and preserving things that have temporary existence. And again, you're sitting there. What, what is that? Everything you're probably spending your days chasing after. <laughs> they will all decay and life will end. Instead, focus on building wealth in your permanent home. Now, isn't that exactly what Manny was he gave us Matthew 6, 33. That's Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and thieves do not break, up and break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart is. It's so interesting. I have this relationship with this gentleman. I won't name him. Some of you know who he is. He's a, uh, a devout Catholic friend. He's pretty aggressive, loves to argue about the Bible. It's very interesting to argue with him because he says, no, you can't be right. Why? Because you're not Catholic. 
by virtue of the fact that you're not Catholic, you can't be right. It's a hard argument to have. But he sends me this, this uh, email this week, because he's on the email list. He responds usually sarcastically, because he calls us prophetic heretics, whatever. So he says, so he says this, what do you think God's money is? That's what he said in the email. I wrote him, do not lay up for yourself treasures in he- on earth where moth but lay up yourself treasures in heaven. That's God's money. Now, he wanted me to say gold, because he's into some gold thing now, but that's what he wanted me to say. It's like, that's not God's money. <laughs> treasures in heaven is God's money. But it goes on to say, right, listen to this. What Manny emphasized, how do you break free? How do you break free from being enamored with or obsessed with or concerned with all this stuff? Therefore, I say, do not worry. He, by the way, we didn't talk about this in advance. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's, is, it, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds. Right? He goes on to tell us, look at the birds. They don't worry. They, they're, not, they're not worried. And your, and your heavenly Father feeds them. Which, and by the way, which of you who worries can add one minute to your life? Right? It's quite the opposite. People worry and they take minutes from their life. So why do you worry about your clothing? Consider the lilies, the flowers in the field. They're so beautiful and they don't concern themselves at all for how they're dressed. God takes care of it all. Now if God clothes the grass of the field, how much more is he going to take care of you, clothe you, right? That's Matthew 6, 25 to 35. Then he gets really convicting. You ready? He says, therefore, again, don't worry about all these things because the people who worry about those things, I'm going to do a Joe Biden. They're pagans. <laughs> They're pagans. You know the, you know the creepy whisper? Have you ever heard that? The creepy whisper? I'm still allowed to say things like that for now. Maybe a few years from now that'll get handcuffs and various other things. The creepy whisper. No, pagans worry about those things. It's the truth. Pagans worry about those things, meaning, meaning unbelievers are the ones that are so constantly focused on provision for themselves. Isn't that true? And then, Manny's introduction. What should you spend your time focusing on? What should you seek? You should seek what's permanent. You should seek what's permanent. What is that? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the other stuff will come. There, that's the verse, Matthew 6, 33. You know, for me, because I never took a whole week just to teach tabernacles, I never taught that part being a tabernacles teaching. Uh, maybe Manny's going to rebuke me later. You might say, no, Jeff, it's not. But, 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 but it, is, it is speaking to what, what's real and permanent and what's temporary. It is speaking to your focus on the heavenly versus the temporary dwelling that you're living in, Right? And then it gets really cool, right? Because not many people know, they're not really following and tracking, but there's a tabernacles encounter in the New Testament during, the, dur- during Jesus' ministry. Do you guys know that? Some of you may know it, some of you may not know it, but it's the entire chapter 7 of John. It starts off in the first nine verses. It says, now the feast of tabernacles was at hand. It was the Feast of Tabernacles. It's interesting, it says the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles, which is a bizarre phrase. That's like saying the American Fourth of July. Only, of course it's the Fourth of July, it's American. It's 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 an American holiday. You don't need to preface it by saying that. This is a translational thing, probably coming in by people that are disconnecting Judaism from Christianity. So they're saying, no, that's the Jewish feast. There's nowhere in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that these feasts are called Jewish. They're called the Feast of the Lord. So that's kind of an interesting phrase. Anyway, we won't make too much of it. But 
What you have to know is if you go back to John chapter 6, which, by the way, might be one of the most, his most controversial, right? Oh, eat my flesh, eat my flesh. You know what I like to say to Jewish people? Eat my flesh. Eat my flesh. Drink my blood. What? That's nuts. But he's, he's radical. So John chapter 6 is right around Passover. And he spends some time in Capernaum after that in Galilee. And he's obviously he's there long enough for the next chapter to be tabernacles, right? You know, there's six months between those, those events, right? So you, you can't just think like, oh, he was in Capernaum. Now he's in Jerusalem the next day. It's six months, right? Because you could see it. And uh, this is what he says in John chapter 6. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. Anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that they shall eat is my flesh. <laughs> That's right. It's crazy, right? It causes controversy, and he stays out. Because of that, he stays out of Judea and Jerusalem. He's like, I'm not going to go, right? And, um, and it's interesting that in those first nine verses of chapter 7, his brothers, and I believe he's talking about biological brothers, like his brothers, they don't even believe. Like, it's probably hard, right? I remember when I first became a believer, there wasn't a single person in my family that could see any difference in me because I was just Jeff. I was Jeff that did all that stuff. So they kept seeing me through those eyes. Well, you know his brothers, his biological brothers, half-brothers if you want to say, they're like, you're the Messiah, get out of here, right? They're not, they're not believing it, so they doubt. So, but they say, hey, listen, we're, gonna, we're going to Jerusalem for the feast. You should come with us. If you have such an important message, it's probably a good location and time of the year to become widely known. And he's like, yeah, I'm not going there. It's kind of a weird thing. He said, I'm not going up. My time hasn't come yet, which means it's going to cause a lot of controversy, and I'm not ready to get... Like, it's not time for that yet, so I'm going to stay out. So he says that, but in, John, in chapter uh, 7, verse 10 through 24, he changes his mind. Um, and the entire concept, when he starts getting questioned, is this. I'm doing what the law says. What about you? Now, he, he, every time he encounters Jewish, Jewish leadership that doesn't believe, he creates controversy. He does not miss the opportunity to stir the pot. So he does go up to the feast. He does so secretly at first. Um, the Jews that are there, he has a reputation. They're expecting him. They're looking for him. And, um, and the talk in the city about him is mixed. It's like some believe he's true, he's authentic. Some say he's the deceiver. And, uh, but the believers are keeping mostly to themselves because it's not popular. It's like it brings, it brings a lot of ridicule and persecution, so they're kind of keeping for them, to themselves. And midway through the feast, which, by the way, we know is eight days, right? It's an eight-day period. He made himself known in the temple, and he taught things, what John 7 says, that astounded the people because he had no formal rabbinic training. They literally say this, how does this man know letters having never studied you know what I think is so cool about this? John never tells us what he says. John doesn't tell us what he's teaching. He just tells us the people are astounded by what he's saying and that his reputation is he's not one of these formally trained rabbis. So how does he know these things? And that's when he comes and says, I'm just doing what the law says. What about you? This is the paraphrase of how he answers. Now, again, this is not what he's teaching. This is his response to them being astounded. You got it? I'll paraphrase. My doctrine is not mine, but he who sent me. If you are in the will of God, you will recognize what I teach is on God's authority. If not, you will miss it. You can also tell where the teaching originates by whom is receiving the glory. Anyone seeking to glorify himself is not from God. That's his answer. And then he exposes them. You know, I love it. It's like, there's my answer. It comes from my father. And then, you claim to follow Moses while breaking the law of Moses. Yikes. You want to kill me for healing a man? Here's the controversy. You want to kill me for healing a man on the Sabbath, and yet Moses would circumcise a child on the eighth day, even if the eighth day was the Sabbath, if that's what it took to obey the command to circumcise on the eighth day. And you are after me because I healed a man on the Sabbath? You're just hypocrites. 
So he stirs this up. So, can you picture this scene? You've got religious leaders who don't believe, and then you have people watching. You're going to rebuke them, right? Go ahead, say something. And they say nothing. So they're like, uh, isn't this the guy that makes you angry? And why do you have nothing to say about what he's saying? Maybe it's true. They literally says, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers actually think maybe he's the Christ? Wow. And they're like, but none of, nobody even knows where he came from. And he's like, you really do know where I came from. Because I came from the God you say you worship. Wow. Now, the unbelievers want to seize him, but it doesn't happen because it says it's not his time. And those who believed could not imagine the Messiah doing anything more miraculous than what they've seen him doing already. So they're totally convinced. That's very interesting. Those who believe, this is going now in 32, verse 32, those who believe, John 7, and what they believe really triggers the Pharisees. So now you have the, 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 the division. You have Yeshua teaching his stuff. you got those who believe, and you have the religious leaders who don't believe, and the stuff they believe now is triggering the Pharisees. And they send officers to arrest him. Yeshua basically says, back off. I'm going away soon anyway. I won't be around much longer. And by the time you realize who I am, it's going to be too late for you. You'll seek me. He says, you'll seek me and not find me. And they're curious about where he's going because what do they think? Earth. Earth. This is the real stuff. Oh, he must be going away into the dispersion somewhere to teach the Greeks. That's where he's going. We won't be able to find him. Of course, he's not talking about that. And then he says this. Quintessential Feast of Tabernacles teaching coming out of the mouth of the Messiah himself in Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. On what day? On the eighth day. It says, on the last day, the great day of the feast. By the way, that's the eighth day. One week from today. Next Friday night at sundown begins the eighth day. What they call the last great day, which you find called Simchat Torah, the joy of the law. We're going to talk all about it next week. This is what he says. He stands up and he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. By the way, you won't find a single verse in the Old Testament that says that. You're not going to find out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It's nowhere. He's giving us a prophetic teaching of the, of the Feast of Tabernacles. And, he's, but, and it says, John says, but this he said concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Why is he teaching about living water during the Feast of Tabernacles? Because it's part of the tabernacle ceremony. Every day during the Feast of Tabernacles, when they're making the offerings in the temple, they would make the offering and they would often do a drink offering, a wine offering over the, over the sacrifice on a normal, a normal sacrifice. But during the Feast of Tabernacles, they poured water, water, over the sacrifice. He knows there's a water libation ceremony. He knows it's attached to the Feast of Tabernacles. He's standing in Jerusalem saying, guess what? That thing you're doing, that's me. That's me. That is me. You've been doing this as a tradition since you, since, since you can remember. They do this because it's, you know, they're, they're doing a thing about, you know, rain for the coming season. And, and God is judging them based on, uh, on their sin. And rainfall is, is you know, a, a sign of life. If you don't have rainfall, you don't have life. But it wasn't long before, way back in the beginning of his ministry, which was very short, that he had a conversation in John 4 with who? The woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. And what did he say? He said, give me a drink. And, she, and he says, 
If you knew the gift of God and who it was that says, give me a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you what? Living water. John 4.10. And then in 13 and 14 it says, whoever drinks this water will thirst again. They pulled out of the well. But whoever drinks the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water that I shall give him will become to him fountains of water springing up into everlasting life. He's connecting his ministry and fulfillment of tabernacles with something they've been doing for, for centuries as part of their tradition. You don't see anywhere in the, in the Torah where it says pour the water over the thing, but they were doing it. It's called the water libation ceremony. He knows about it. He's standing in their midst saying, that's me. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Proclaiming to everyone who can hear, to all who can hear, that this is me. And it says, it says, proclaiming to all who could hear. So that sparked me. John writes, to all those who could hear, which gives us the idea that not everyone can hear. Why? I believe that's the clue to what he was actually teaching about in the temple. See, we didn't see it. John doesn't tell us what he's teaching. Just their response. I think it has something to do about what he was teaching because even though you don't see it, only the response. My doctrine's not mine. It's, it's he who sent me. Um, and other than his response about defending the healing on the Sabbath, you don't know what he's, what he's saying. However, if you go back into the other Gospels and track to the same point which you see, when did he arrive? What, what's the timing of that Passover that we see in John chapter 6? Which you'll see in the other Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on the water, the hanging around in Galilee in the spring, and right before the transfiguration in Matthew 15, 1 to 20, and Mark 7, 1 to 23, you do have a teaching. I'm thinking very likely the teaching that John is referring to but never tells us what it is. And you know what that teaching says? And remember what he said in John, you'll seek me. There's going to come a time that you'll seek me and you won't be able to find me. It's like you can't hear. What does he teach in, in Matthew? Matthew, I'll just pull it out of Matthew, chapter 15, the first 20 verses. You know what they ask him? Why do, can you picture him now sitting in Jerusalem, in the tabernacle, in the temple area, in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, being challenged, and this is what they say, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? And he's thinking, man, I am going to annihilate that question. And he starts off with, I really love you very much. No, he says this, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded. Now, do you remember what they said? How does this guy know letters? Remember what they said? How does he know letters? He's not formally trained. He says, for God commanded. And he goes on to quote Exodus and Leviticus. Boom, 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 boom. And then he concludes, thus you have made the commandment. He quotes the commandments. Thus you have made the commandments of God no effect by your tradition, you hypocrites. And then he goes on to say, well did Isaiah. What? How do you know Isaiah said anything about you? These people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me and in vain they worship me, teaching the doctrines and commandments of men. See, they can't hear him. Very, very likely, this is what he's teaching in the temple in that moment. Hear and understand, not what goes into a mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of a mouth defiles a man. They're astounded. We've never heard anything like this before. Where did he get this stuff before? My doctrine is not my own. It comes from my Father who sent me. Then the disciples, after that, they get him aside. They say, do you know what, that the Pharisees were afraid? Do you know the Pharisees were offended 
when they heard you saying that stuff? <laughs> He's like, I did it on purpose. <laughs> That's what he does, right? So you see, I think it's very cool. Again, I don't know if, you know, maybe, uh, I'm not a scholar, right? I'm just reading the Bible, right? Maybe, maybe there are teachings that say this is what he was teaching. But I just know, I'm thinking it had to, it's so, it's so consistent with, with their response and their amazement, right? Because this is the kind of teaching that would amaze people, that he would get up and say things, quoting Bible verses, never being trained. He's just a carpenter. He's Mary's son. Aren't those his brothers? Amazing, right? And it's really cool that what comes after is the transfiguration. So the transfiguration is a very cool thing. That's what we're going to finish today. And I'm calling it the transfigurations because it's, it's his and yours. Again, remember, he tabernacled among us. And here's the thing that I got. He tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory. When did they behold his glory? Now, of course, we could say they beheld his glory through his whole ministry. It was glorious. But they really beheld his glory when they stood up on the mountain with him and he transfigured into a glorious being of light right in their eyes. Didn't they? Right? They witnessed it. Right? In Matthew 17, the first eight verses, he goes up onto the mountain with the big three, right? You know who they are, Peter, James, and John. And he transfigures into what we will learn later is a glorified human, a glorified being. It's an important thing to get because we know, maybe if I jump ahead a, a bit, the events that take place that eventually lead to his glorified body, not, not this picture, like he, he, he goes back to normal, right? Goes down the mountain with them, he's back to being Jesus the human. But when he gets his real glorified body, you remember that's a, that's a strategic decision in the Garden of Eden, I mean the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane where he's asking the Father if there's any possible way to take this cup, but if there's no possible way, I'll, 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 I'll do it. And that moment right there is when he's making his permanent decision to go to the cross, and because he goes to the cross, he resurrects, and because he resurrects, he becomes what? A glorified human. See, he could have, he could have opted out. I think we have to believe that. He could have said, I don't want to. Go back to being a spiritual being. He doesn't have to be a glorified being. But it's so cool. It's so cool because that's the body you're getting. And as we know in the Bible, you can't intermarry species, interspecies marriage. You have to be the same species to be the bride of Christ. That's why right now he's glorified and you're fully human. And you're fully human. You can't be his bride. You can only be his betrothed. The wedding doesn't come until when? Until we're glorified until we have glorified bodies. Isn't that cool? So we also know on the mountain, Moses and Elijah appear. Every time I mention this, you know it's comical. I always wonder, how do they know? Are they carrying ID badges? I'm Moses. You can see pictures of them on, on YouTube. I don't know where they got the pictures. But you know, Moses is, and Elijah appear, you got the, they're prophetic, right? Moses is prophetic of the law, what you would know as grace-empowered, faith-based obedience to the law. And... Uh, and uh, Elijah, prophetic of the prophets, uh, especially the prophet who prepares a way for the Messiah. So those two appear, and Peter, uh, Peter James, and John, um, they decide what? I think we should make some tabernacles. We should make some temporary dwellings. It's good that we're all here together. Let's make one for each of you. And then what happens? This voice from heaven comes. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased just like the voice at his baptism. And it's so cool that in, in verse 9, 17, 9, Yeshua says, don't tell anyone what happened on this mountain until after I'm glorified, until after this whole thing is done. Besides, why? Who are they going to tell? What are they going to say? Oh, we went up on a mountain with Jesus, and he turned into a being of light, and Moses and Elijah appeared. <laughs> it's probably a good idea they don't say anything to anybody right it's going to sound completely bizarre right but you know what's really cool Peter who was there in 2nd Peter chapter 1 verses 7 and 8, 17 and 18 he's writing about this 
And he's telling about being up on the mountain and hearing the voice, which of course is after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. He's actually obeying. You can tell people about this later. And that's what he does, right? Of course, they ask this great prophetic question, maybe one of the most important prophetic questions as they come down from the mountains. Um, you know, why do the scribes say Elijah must come first? They don't talk about Moses, but they refer to Elijah. And uh, they already know Elijah must come first to pave a way for the coming of the Lord because, because, they, because this is in the Bible. It's in their scriptures, right? Now, of course, uh, later on in the book of Acts, um, he's going to talk about this too. I mean, they, they're going to have this revelation. But this is his answer. He says, indeed, Elijah's coming first and will restore all things. So Elijah comes first before Messiah, restores all things. But I have to also tell you, there's a connection between Elijah and John the Baptist. They understood this. They literally understood. This is in verses 11 to 13, that this connection to Elijah and John the Baptist, who they did whatever they wanted to, which is what? They, they persecuted him and they executed him and, and so on, right? So what's the connection? The connection is, is multi-layered. not going to spend that much time, but just so you can see the connection. It starts off very simply in the prophecy over John the Baptist's life before he was born in Luke 1.17. Right? He's, he's, he's being told, essentially, you're going to fulfill the interim ministry of Elijah. It says, he will, he, he will also go before him. He, John, goes before him, Messiah. How? In the spirit and power of Elijah. And then it talks about Elijah ministry. What is that? To turn hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. All those indicators, turning hearts and making ready and preparing a way for the Lord, it's all an Elijah ministry. But he's not Elijah, is he? He comes in the spirit of Elijah. They ask him later on, are you Elijah? He's like, uh-uh. Nope, not me. But I am the one who prepares a way in, in the wilderness for the Lord, right? That's what he says. So he even identifies in his earthly ministry his connection to Elijah, right? And, 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 and that prophecy over John's life, you see, you see connected to the prophecies of Malachi 4, the last three verses in the Old Testament, 4 to 6, and Isaiah 40, which the whole thing is important, but just specifically 40, verse 3. We're going to get to that in a second. So what are some of the prophetic details of the transfiguration, right? We know who's up on the mountain. And again, we're doing this to connect it to tabernacles. They witnessed the transfiguration. We understand that he was tabernacling among us and we witnessed his glory. And the, the idea is what is a glorified body? See, because that's the permanent body. That's what you're seeking. That's your permanent home. It's the, it's the, it's the incorruptible body you inherit, specifically spoken about in 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 54. It's the body that we just said Yeshua inherited because he decided not to abandon the mission in the garden and go to the cross and be dead for three days and resurrect. And it's the one that he, it's the one we have to inherit in order to be his bride. Of course, this Moses and Elijah thing um, is important because it's what connects us back to his baptism. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And it connects us back to specifically what it says in the prophecies about the very end of the age, leading up to all of us receiving these glorified bodies. This is what it says. Remember the law of Moses. There's the connection to Moses. My servant, which I commanded him in Horeb, and all of Israel, with its statutes and judgments. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what will he do? He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The last three verses of the Old Testament. Right? The curse is the curse that remains over creation if you don't have a restoration that's, that's, uh, that's the ministry. Elijah comes, it says in Matthew 17, to restore all things. That Elijah ministry 
is what needs to happen for the universe, for, the, for creation to be restored. Otherwise, the curse remains. The curse remains. And of course, Isaiah 43 says, a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare a way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. That's what he became declaring. Doesn't it say, remember John's, before he baptized the connection, right? The connection, this is my son. When John was baptizing Jesus and the voice came out of heaven, where did John come from? He came out of the wilderness. He was in the wilderness eating bark and berries, and bugs, and carob, and all sorts of stuff. And he looked like, and he was covered in like, you know, sackcloth. And he was hairy and big, and like he looked like a homeless person. Right? And that's what, you know, later on in Acts, it talks about, you know, the sending of Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the restoration of all things. So there's this pre predicate ministry, the ministry of, the, of Elijah. And some of us believe it's a real Elijah. Some of us believe it's the spirit of Elijah. Some of us believe it's both coming again. But even us, that we carry, if you have this prophetic preparation unction, you carry the spirit of Elijah. You want to prepare a way for the Lord. And you prepare a way for the Lord how? How? By, 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 in a sense, practicing your own transfiguration, your own glorified life, your own um, disconnect, for a sense, saying, this is not my home. This is not my permanent residence. It literally says this. You want to hear this? Paul writing to the Philippians. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that it may become conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue things to himself, all things to himself. You see that connection? We, when he comes back, we get a glorified body. When we resurrect in a glorified body. He needs that. We have to be conformed into his image that way, otherwise we can't be his bride. We can't get married. Remember I mentioned 1 Corinthians 15 earlier? This is what it says in verses 42 to 44. So also is the, so also is the resurrection of the dead, the body that's sown in corruption, say corruption, temporary, is raised in incorruption, permanent, sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. That's what you're getting. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever watched something in a recording, like back when, probably outdates all of you, but we used to have things where you could do like recording on your DVD player, like you can watch something later, like you'd have to record it on a disc or sometimes in the hard drive. So that would happen. But if you ever recorded a game, like a sporting event, and then you went to watch it later, what is it like when you already know the outcome of the game? What is it like if you already know your team won? This is what it's like. No matter what goes on during the game, you never have anxiety. You can enjoy the game, watch the plays, Thinking the whole time, I know who won already. See, that's what he's saying for you to do. If this is what you're getting, if this is the end of the game, if this is the score at the end of the game, you want to hear it again? Incorruption. Incorruption. Glory. Power. Spiritual body. That's the score at the end of the game. So why are you sitting around so concerned with the temporary dwelling you're living in? Why is that such a concern? Why isn't it your currency heavenly currency? Besides, your temporary dwelling, this thing, it can't bring the kingdom. It can't, it, can't, it can't participate in the kingdom, so to speak. Listen to what it says. Now this I say, brethren, this is continuing 1 Corinthians 15, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Here it is. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet, feast of trumpets, 
the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and will should be changed, for this, in, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and the mortal must put on immortality. A glorified, permanent body. The Feast of Tabernacles is not just some event that took place in the wilderness. It's to tell you, you are just a sojourner passing through. Do not set up permanent homes here. Do not set up walled cities here. I love Romans. I love Paul, Romans 14, 17. Some of you know this. The kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking. He could have said anything. The kingdom of God is not in your money, in your job, in your position, in your marriage, in how many children you have, in the house you live in, and in, your, in your political affiliation. It's in none of those things. It's in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. There's your, there is your permanent dwelling. Hmm. You want to know what the marriage looks like? See, you can't consummate a marriage with a different species. This is when it happens, right? We're going to fast, all the way, fast forward all the way to the end. And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, <laughs> the tabernacle of God is with men. The Feast of Tabernacles. Now you tabernacle in your permanent tabernacle, not a temporary dwelling. And they shall be his people. I shall be their God and they shall be my people. God himself will be with them and he will be their God. And you know what it says? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. That is the score at the end of the game in your permanent dwelling. I'll finish with this one passage from 2 Corinthians 3.16 uh, uh, through 18. Because it's just this, it's just, it's just like what it might look like, the snapshot in time about what it might look like when you're looking at the score at the end. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken out of the way. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. See, if you're living in this temporary tabernacle, and all your focus is on the things of this world, you're in bondage not liberty, but we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as the Spirit of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18. Can you see it? Looking into the mirror at the end of the game, into your glorified Christ-like being. See, the whole thing, the whole reason why we rehearse, we look at the details and imagery of the Feast of Tabernacles is to get this one thing. Israel left and they dwelt in temporary dwellings. You see, all the ceremonies, even the pouring the water, it all was pointing to Christ the whole time. Your permanent tabernacle. That's why he got up and he stood there in the middle of the feast on the, the last great day the day that signifies eternity. And then you could see that that transfiguration, that's exactly what he's showing us. Hey, listen, you want to see what the permanent tabernacle looks like? You want to see what you're about to inherit? You want to see the scorecard at the end? Let me give you a little glimpse. It's a being of light, incorruptible, full of power, full of glory, full of honor, immortality. So I want to encourage you as you go through this festival. This is the festival of joy. This is the festival to remind us we don't have to be attached to the things of this world. You're not of this world. It's a, it's a, it's a week of celebrations. And we come back next week, 
We'll talk about what happens when it's all over. What does eternity look like? Amen? Amen. Father, we just thank you so much for this day. I thank you for your, your feasts that we get to rehearse them as a holy rehearsal each year to learn a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more revelation. But more importantly, Lord, that it changes us as we leave here today. Something touched somebody's heart where they're going to walk out different, see life different, maybe focus a little more on their permanent home in the mighty name of Yeshua. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.